and about any of our food access work and some of the work that we're doing uh, with community gardens throughout the area. We'd love to hear from you. Before we start tonight, I would like to thank our wonderful sponsors, Frontier Natural Products, Lancaster Agriculture, and UMass Risk Management Crop Insurance Education Program for supporting the production of this series. I'd also like to thank New Entry Sustainable Farming Project and the Tufts Friedman School of Nutritional Science and Policy for allowing access to the WebEx software that we're using tonight for this webinar. Lastly, many thanks to all, all the NOFA Mass staff and board members who have helped to make this workshop, workshop possible. If you're not currently a member of NOFA Mass, I really encourage you to join uh, to join NOFA Mass as a member. Uh, your membership really supports our education and policy work and makes webinars and podcasts like these possible. And a great thank you to our current members who may be on the line or watching this tonight. Tonight's presenter is Alex Dorr. He is the owner and founder of Mushroom Revival, and the subject tonight will be on microremediation. The format for tonight's webinar will be a little different as you will be allowed to submit questions that Alex will answer throughout the presentation. We'll take little station breaks so that we can read those questions and get those answers. And a great way to send in your questions is to use the chat feature, which is located at the top right-hand corner of your screen. Now, just to show that it works and that you're uh, not having any difficulties with that, I would love it if everyone could type in uh, where they're from, uh, what farm they're on, or if they're at a community garden, and if they are watching this with uh, more than one person. If you are calling in via the phone, feel free to text me your questions. You can text me at this phone number, 413-214-1237. So without any further ado or further haste, I'm going to turn over um, our webinar tonight to Alex Dorr. Thanks, Anna. Uh, welcome, everyone. All right, thank you. Um, super excited for this uh, talk on microremediation. Um, so I'll jump right in. Let me just share my screen. Can everyone see that? Great. Um, so I'll get started. Um, so I'm going to talk about microremediation of urban soil. Um, this is a, a topic that I'm, I'm very passionate about. And thank you, Anna, for um, your introduction. Um, microremediation is the, the cleaning up of toxic waste in our soils or waters with mushrooms. Um, it's, a, it's a topic that I feel very inspired by, and I think the world really needs at this point with our overaccumulation of, of toxic waste. So a little bit about me, um, as Anna talked about, um, I am the owner and founder of Mushroom Revival. Um, it's a Western Massachusetts-based medicinal mushroom company. Um, we specialize in growing a specific kind of medicinal mushroom called Cordyceps militaris. We also do farm consulting. Um, teaching people how to grow their own food and medicine. Um, I'm also the author of a book, Microremediation Handbook. Uh, this was published last year all about uh, microremediation and giving people tools so they can clean up toxic waste um, and do it on a, either a, a low-tech grassroots scale or a commercial scale. So what are mushrooms? Um, if you don't know, uh, this is a great little story, so sit back you know, put in the popcorn um, and, and learn as much as you can. They're, they're fascinating beings. I mean, most people don't know what they are. Uh, they think a mushroom is a plant or a vegetable, um, or they're scared of them. Or we have a lot of mycophobia, um, a fear of mushrooms in, in the United States. Um, but believe it or not, uh, there's this really convincing theory that mushrooms came from space. Um, spores of, of mushrooms that are still viable have um, been found on the noses of rocket ships re-entering the atmosphere. Um, and so there's this theory that they came on an asteroid millions and millions of years ago, and uh, that's how life came on this planet. This is an actual picture of the event. I took it <laughs> way back. Um, 
and and this is you know an inoculation of our planet um you know mushrooms are very resilient i'm going to talk about that a lot um and and how we can weave in that resilience in our communities and in our farms so so this is a mushroom that was found by researchers um under the ocean um so this is a schizophilum mushroom and they found it in rock uh, buried deep beneath the ocean and it was dormant for 20 million years and was able to still fruit an actual mushroom, which is pretty remarkable. Um, we have other cases of lichen, uh, a symbiotic relationship between cyanobacteria and fungi that's over 2,200 million years old. One of the first, if not the first, land organisms. Um, a piece of lichen was, was thrown out of the U.S. space station for six months in the back in the space, they brought it back into the space station and it continued growing like nothing happened. So radiation, the vacuum of space, mushrooms can withstand it. And if, you're, if we're talking about, you know, an oil spill on your farmland or E. coli or anything, I assure you mushrooms can, can do the trick. Um, these are prototaxites. Um, these are also lichen. Um, these are one of the first land organisms and they're responsible for creating soil um they when the earth uh was very young uh everything was just pure rock and uh these lichens excrete enzymes to break down the rock and and make mineral rich soil so when they when they first found these prototaxites um as you can see in the last picture they first discovered it they, they didn't know what it was um they they did some cross cuttings and found these rings that looked like uh, a ring of a tree. Um, they're like, oh, it's a, this is an ancient tree. Um, and they did DNA analysis and they figured out that this is 95% fungi or 95% mushrooms. Um, and so the theory is that these prototaxites started to evolve into early trees. Um, and so basically the story is that Mushrooms came from space. They, they formed this symbiotic relationship with photosynthetic organisms, and they evolved into the plants that we see today. So the plants that we work with in our farms, um, they're, they're alien fungal uh, relatives. And, um, and over time, they started forming this relationship underground called mycorrhizae fungi. Um, this is a really fascinating field. And if anyone is a gardener, I think everyone is in this group, um, you should definitely know about mycorrhizae fungi um, it, for the health of your soil, the health of your plants, and also for um, cleaning up any heavy metals in your soil um, or filtering any chemicals, etc. Um, this is a symbiotic relationship between the roots of a plant, rhizal, and, and mushrooms, um, or myco, so mycorrhizae fungi. And it's thought of as the internet of the forest. These mycorrhizae fungi can connect to um, hundreds of trees in a forest and communicate and send messages in between trees and in between plants. And they connect over 95% of plants. 95% um, of plants have this, this mycorrhizae connection. Um, and they can, you know, send nutrients to a plant that's not getting enough sunlight. And um, it, they're almost like the hand in a puppet and all the plants, all the trees that you see are basically the puppets and these, these mushrooms or this mycelium is this, this real network, uh, the, the nervous system of, of biology, really. Um, and they, they also develop this mechanism to decompose. So they're, they're the great janitors, they're the great recyclers of our forest. And they create, just like the early prototypes, they developed these enzymes to be able to break down organic matter, which gives them the ability to excrete enzymes to break down things like petroleum hydrocarbons and, and toxic pesticides that we see on our farmlands um, and are being sprayed more and more. Um, so, so this is a white rot fungi you see. Um, you know, when a, a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, fungi come and clean it up. They, they're, they're really humble stewards of, of a forest or the land and the soil. They create abundance of soil. So, so this is a, a mycorrhizae connection. Um, they're helping each other out. 
um, a cross-species symbiotic relationship. Um, and there's another theory that over time, uh, after they evolved from the prototaxites into uh, early trees, and they started branching out into these mushrooms that we, we know today. Um, and then our early ancestors stumbled upon these mushrooms, some of them being psychoactive, um, produced effects like this. Um, this is an artistic representation. Um, of course, this is all theory. Um, and, you know, even the theory of Adam and Eve, this, uh, that mushrooms were the, the apple that Adam and Eve, um, regardless of your religious view, um, this is just uh, a theory. Um, and it helped boost human evolution um, through neurogenesis over many, many thousands of years. It helped us as humans evolve into where we are today. Um, this is a theory in the book Food of the Gods. Um, it's a it's a very interesting book, but you can see the sacred relationship between humans and and mushrooms all throughout time, um, all throughout the world. You see uh, cave paintings, you see mushroom statues. It's almost um, like a religion, and, and you know, and and the basis of so many religions all around the world, and holidays, and um, it's very mythical. Um, there's there's a word um, in Aztec Tiananmen, which means flesh of the gods. Um, it has a, a godly connotation. Um, even the oldest naturally preserved human, Atsi or Utsi, the Iceman, um, was, was buried in, in a sheet of ice in the Swiss Alps. Um, and he was in a hibernation for over 5,000 years. And he was found with two mushrooms on his body. Um, Tinder conch, Fomus fomentarius, and Birch polypora, Pitsiporus betulinus. Um, and he was using these for healing. Um, so we can see throughout time, Humans have had this sacred relationship with mushrooms, and they're using them for practical use. Um, he was using this to carry embers of a fire and cure intestinal parasites and to also help with an ancient form of arthritis. Um, and we can see it in our basis of our religions as, uh, as well, or in our holidays. Um, so there's this theory that Christmas uh, was derived from the, uh, the shamanic use of uh, a psychoactive mushroom in Siberia, and um, you know it's a it's a long story, and I only have 45 minutes, but um, I'm I'm happy to share it at a separate time. But um, you know, even in in China, there's in ancient scrolls with a lingji or a reishi mushroom, um, and and you can see this mushroom depicted on emperor's staffs, and it's called the 10,000 year mushroom mushroom of immortality. And I'm going to talk about medicinal mushrooms as well because I feel like um, mushrooms are medicinal for the earth and also our bodies. Um, and, and at one level, it's all the same thing. Um, and they, they do a very amazing job at decomposing toxins in our soil that cause cancer, but also the toxins in our own body that cause cancer and, and boosting um, our immune systems to fight, fight um, those chemicals that we are um, being in contact with in everyday life. Um, and a lot of people consume fungi every day and don't even know it. If you drink kombucha, sweet and sour soup, miso soup, drink beer, wine, bread, you're consuming fungi. Um, a lot of these things, are, uh, they have yeast in them, which is a fungi. So a lot of people have a fear of fungi and don't even know that um, they are consuming it on a daily basis. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, um, it's almost the structure of their life. I know a lot of people that can't go a day without drinking a beer at the end of the day or, you know, having some bread uh, or a glass of wine at the end of the day, um, etc. So, you know, humans are not the only ones that have this amazing relationship. And, and I'm going to bring up bees because it's really important for, for farmers. Um, as everyone knows, the bees are dying um, and mushrooms have this amazing ability to give them a chance. Um, this is Paul Stamp's slogan. If anyone doesn't know, he's a great mycologist and um, highly recommend looking him up. But medicinal mushrooms are not only good for humans, but they're also good for bees and boosting their immune system um, for uh, prevention um, and boosting the immune system so they can help uh, protect themselves against pesticides and insecticides and things like that. Um, and not only that, but there's this one fungi that can attack varroa mites, but not the bee. 
Um, and so I, I have this culture of this fungi. Actually, Monsanto patented it, um, so don't tell anyone. But um, it's, it's, very, it's very incredible for beekeepers and farmers alike that we have uh, a chance um, to save the bees and, and doing, doing something really practical and, and worthwhile. And humans have known this relationship for thousands and thousands of years. This is a really old cave painting in northern Algeria um, that shows a bee shaman. Um, it shows the sacred relationship between humans, bees, and mushrooms, um, which I feel like is, is going to be the future. And um, we have a lot of researchers on it. So uh, stay tuned. Um, but they're not always friendly. So fungi are not only always friendly to insects, as I, as I just talked about, with, they can kill varroa mites, they can kill ticks. Um, on the left, you can see a picture of a parasitic wasp that I'm holding. Um, this is in the Galapagos Islands um, off the coast of Ecuador. Um, and, you know, some mushrooms actually parasitize insects. So this can be actually very good for, for farmers, um, given the right strain of this this type of mushroom and you know if you have a beetle or you have some sort of agricultural pest um, we can develop a strain that is specific for that type of insect um, which is is really crucial and it's a bio safe insecticide which is, is huge so they can also be medicinal as well this is cordyceps sinescens this is grown in the hills of tibet um, and this is an incredible medicinal mushroom it's worth four times its weight in gold. Um, and this is the mushroom that I uh, cultivate. Um, it's a relative, and it's called Cordyceps militaris. Uh, this is a picture of me holding it. Um, I don't use any bugs. I, I use uh, supplemented rice. And, and this is the farm that I have in Western Massachusetts is growing this medicine for people. Um, this is really good. Olympic athletes use it. Um, increases oxygen in the bloodstream. Um, lung capacity, athletic performance, um, energy, uh, things like that. It's, really, it's a really amazing mushroom. Um, and it's great for farmers who are working in the fields all day and need a, an extra kick. Um, it's also really good for the immune system as well. Um, this is a close-up picture looking into a jar of, of cordyceps. So this, this is my business. Uh, and this is just, you know, what I, I do. Um, I, I look at both aspects of, of healing. Um, it's healing people, and it's also healing the earth. Um, and I also donate 10% to uh, plant trees in the local area um, to create food forests to feed homeless and to, uh, you know, replenish the biodiversity of the planet. So mushroom, mushrooms are really incredible, and we're seeing a, a, a renaissance of, um, and a revival. Uh, that's why I named my company Mushroom Revival, uh, because I feel like it can weave in all aspects of, of of human life and, and life itself. So we're seeing a lot more growers growing and cultivating these mushrooms and working with them, um, which is really amazing because we can grow our own food, we can grow our own medicine, and the waste product of all this cultivation can be used to clean our soils and clean our waterways. So this is home. It might look familiar. This is an artistic representation of basically what homo sapiens are doing to the earth. Not everyone, um, hopefully not everyone, anyone listening to this, um, but a, a good majority of people are participating um, in destruction in, in one form of, of another. And I think it really stems from uh, a complete separation. Um, we, we forget that we are one with the universe and we are the earth. Uh, we are our soils, we are our water, um, and we are each other. Um, and I think Healing that, um, we, we can heal our, our farmlands and our, our soils and our waterways. So a fun fact, if Earth's history is compared to a calendar year, modern human life has existed for 23 minutes, and we have used one-third of Earth's natural resources in the last 0.2 seconds. Pretty remarkable. So sustainable? I don't think so. We have way too many humans on this planet, and it's an estimated that 80 billion pounds of hazardous organic pollutants are produced annually by the chemical, agricultural, oil, paper, textile, aerospace, and other industries in the U.S. alone. And that's just reported. And it's only, only about 10% of these wastes are believed to be disposed of in an environmentally safe manner. Um, that was in 1988. 
I'm sure those numbers are much higher now. So, you know, this is, this shouldn't be news. This, um, you know, this, this should be old news. This should be, uh, you know, covering what we already know. We're deforesting our forests. Um, we're mining. And uh, when, when we deforest our forests and we, we dig into the soils, we're, we're really um, damaging the, the biodiversity of our soil. Soil is alive. Um, our water is alive. And when we do this, we're killing off the mycorrhizae fungi, we're, we're killing off the bacteria, um, and we're polluting place that we can grow food and medicine for our people. Um, and we're, ki we're killing each other, we're enslaving each other, causing genocide. Um, when I say we, uh, you know, of course not everyone, uh, it's just a general term, feel free to exclude yourself from that we statement. Um, and, and many people are spraying our food with, with toxic chemicals. You can see the bottom picture. He's actually protecting himself from the chemicals which he's spraying on food which people are going to put in their bodies. It's, it's absurd. Um, and we're creating monocultures which is destroying biodiversity of life. Um, and we're even making entire food products out of chemicals and not just spraying them on. Um, so this is, this is a good representation of, of where we are at in our, in our evolution. Um, a lot of people, you know, I'm, su I'm sure everyone in this, in this meeting is, is not in, portrayed in this image. Um, so what's the solution? One, one that I bring up and, and one my intention of, of speaking in this, in this webinar is to, to give light and shine light on the incredible ability of, of fungi. Um, and, their, and their healing ability in our world. So as I was talking before, I think mushrooms are, are medicine in, in all aspects, whether they're medicinal mushrooms, uh, reishi, chaga, turkey tail, psychedelic mushrooms. Um, you know, uh, regardless of the law, they, there's a lot of research coming out that is really good for end of life care, OCD, um, uh, addiction, and, and things like that. Culinary mushrooms, um, we need more food. Uh, there's too many people hungry on our planet, and we need uh, protein-rich food um, that is vegan and, and really nourishing. Uh, Micro-restoration is, is building soils, building our forests, and micro-remediation is uh, cleaning up the, the toxic waste, the heavy metals, the bacteria that is harmful for us, um, and the chemicals. So medicinal mushrooms, we can take these every day. Um, and, and this is micro-remediation, so, so we want to boost our immune systems, uh, especially when we're working on a toxic site, if our farmland or, you know, say we're working in an urban setting um, and we're constantly surrounded by exhaust from cars and maybe lead in our soils, we, we want to boost our immune system and have uh, support in our, in our body so we ourselves are not also getting the lead we, um, and we're, we're protecting ourselves and our family and our community. Um, psilocybin mushrooms, as, as I talked about before, um, not legal in all countries, but, but definitely legal in, in some countries in the world. Um, and, and a lot of amazing health benefits for, for gourmet mushrooms, um, which is amazing because we can grow this food, we can grow this medicine, and then bring it into our soils to create more soils and, and to clean up waste in our soils. Um, and, and this is what you know, some wood chips look like when they're, they're being decomposed by mycelium. Mycelium is the white filamentous structure that you see um, wrapped around these wood chips, uh, which is really great if you mulch your garden. Um, they will feed nutrients to the plants and, and create a, a beautiful symbiotic relationship. Um, and th this leads us to the, the nitty gritty of microremediation. So the potential for microremediation is, is very huge. It's, it's a very new field. It's a new science. Um, we have much more uh, data and experience with using bacteria and using plants for cleaning up toxic waste. But um, as I was talking about before, we have a fear of, of mushrooms, especially in the United States. So the, the lack of research, uh, you know, we're, we're just at the beginning. Um, as you can see in this chart, out of all the, the um, remediation technologies, the commercial remediation technologies, micro-remediation is the cheapest um, for the cost of soil remediation um, for petroleum hydrocarbons, uh, different oil contaminated soil, um, the price per ton of soil. 
Um, microremediation using mushrooms to clean up soils is the cheapest. Um, and it's, it's really the combination of, of research, um, scientists in the lab um, coming up with new te techniques and new species and um, really testing and getting data. Citizen science, so people just going out and doing it. Um, industri industry, so people with a lot of money um, uh, funding this and, and doing it at a much larger scale and, and a commercial scale. So it needs to be financially sustainable or it will bitter out. Unfortunately, um, so uh, fungi have a, a great ability to to uh, clean up three main types of waste, um, and a fourth one, which which I'll touch upon, but I don't think anyone will come across it. So first will be chemicals. Um, the second is heavy metals, and the third is biological. So um, biologicals, an example would be E. coli. And the fourth one would be radiation, um, which I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, there's no Chernobyl happening around here, knock on wood. Um, but atrazine would be an example of a chemical that, that fungi can actively remediate. And atrazine is, is sprayed everywhere. It's a weed killer. Um, really funny that we kill weeds. <laughs> Some of them are incredibly nutritious and, and medicinal for us. But um, we have a fear of fungi. We have a fear of weeds. Um, so the way that fungi do it is the same way that they, they break down trees in the forest. Um, they secrete enzymes. Uh, the same way that w when we eat food, um, we have enzymes with acids in our mouth and our gut to break down um, the material. Uh, fungi excrete them externally. So it's kind of like us throwing up our stomach acids onto a plate of food, uh, degrading it, and, and that's the way that they um, break down chemicals in our soil. Um, biologicals like E. coli, the mycelium makes this, this thick uh, fibrous mat and, and the E. coli trying to swim through that, um, the chitin binds to the E. coli and actually consumes it as a protein source. Um, I just, I'm working with this group in Vermont um, in the United States and we just got uh, granted uh, $10,000 to work on E. coli filtration for farmers. Um, which is really exciting, and we're using uh, a species called Strophaeria uh, garden giant. Um, and so we're going to have data in the, in the next couple months, and it's, it's really important for dairy farmers who uh, are leaching a lot of E. coli into the waterways. Whoops. Um, so heavy metals is, is the third type of pollutant that uh, mushrooms can, uh, or fungi can address, and the example is arsenic. So there's, there's many different ways in which fungi can address these metals. One is biosorption. So they can bind heavy metals to the surface of their mycelium and just kind of hold it there. Um, and this is really important so they're not um, being brought up in your kale, they're not being brought up in your broccoli um, or, or whatever plant you're trying to eat. They just hold it into the soil, uh, make sure it doesn't go into a waterway. Solubilization um, is kind of the same uh, idea is just making the metals more soluble um, and or immobile um, to make sure they don't move anywhere. They're just in one place. And then translocation or microaccumulation is the action of hyperaccumulating the metals into the mycelium and translocating it into the, an actual mushroom. Um, or they have a mycorrhizae association and it brings it into the plant itself. And the plant can do a various uh, things which the plant can keep it in its roots, they can put it in uh, its shoots, or they can put it in its leaves. And in some cases, they can actually volatilize uh, the heavy metals um, into, into a, a less toxic form into the air. So, so this is a list. Um, if anyone is watching on their computer, they can screenshot this. Um, or, you know, this is in my book, um, and you're welcome to purchase my book. And um, I give a list of different um, plants that are really good at hyperaccumulating heavy metals. So this this is really important if you're a farmer um, and you test your soil, you have a various um, heavy metals in your soil. Um, so say for for lead, sunflower is really good, brown mustard, geranium, corn, tomato, buckwheat, willow, um, a couple of things. So um, you can combine it with mycorrhizae fungi to increase the ability to pull heavy metals out of the soil and de detoxify your soil. Um, 
So, so what do you do when you, when you think you have a, a contaminated site or maybe you don't know, you're, you're purchasing farmland and you don't really know the history of it. It's, it's really important to do site history. Um, I know a lot of stories that people have bought land um, and they didn't know that it was a way station and it, there's a lot of 18 wheelers leaking oil. Um, and they're actually sued uh, because uh, there is a big flooding and, and a lot of oil went into their neighbor's land so um, definitely do a lot of research on your site um, and and also you know it, you know it could be not in the u.s you could be in ecuador you can be in somewhere else where um, politics and legal workings can can really be um, into play um, and get a team together um, you can't a lot of times you can't do everything by yourself make a plan um, get funding community outreach if if you uh if you find out you know maybe my land is contaminated um test it uh there's a lot of great um places that do really cheap testing or sometimes for free um if uh you have direct connections um, make a bench scale test so do it on a really small scale see if it works um make it a little bigger and then full-on remediation um your whole site try to remediate the toxins on it. Um, and, and you really want to test, you know, I'm, I'm sure your situation wouldn't look anything like this where you would wear a hazmat suit, but pH, temperature, mineral content, contaminants, microbial life, etc. cetera, you, you want the full spectrum of what's going on. Um, and if you don't have money for testing, uh, a very low tech testing is using um, beans. So you basically uh, say you have atrazine in your soil, you can have different dilutions of atrazine um, in these cocoa core uh, uh, little cubes and you germinate the seeds in, in the different dilutions and you look at your site and you basically, uh, you know, um, look at where your plants are on this spectrum to get a, a good um, or a semi, you know, good uh, reading of, of of how contaminated your soil is so so this is uh you know um leaky oil from a tractor um, we went to the site and uh, we spread oyster mycelium that already produced a lot of oysters to feed people and we spread this mycelium on it um, to leach the enzymes to break down the oil um, if anyone's a farmer working with tractors this is a a big thing um, you could have you know a lot of leaks that can go in your soil um, different runoff depending on what kind of runoff, um, if your farm is downstream of a big parking lot, or yeah, you have a dairy farm and, and the E. coli is running off into a waterway, um, you can use mycorrhizae fungi or fungal barriers to, um, to filter uh, that uh, there's heavy metals or the biologicals or the chemicals. Um, so mycorrhizae fungi, I, t I talked a little bit about it um, but they're, they're really incredible for transferring valuable nutrients to the plant like phosphorus, nitrogen, copper, zinc, iron, nickel, um, and, and they form a, a, a very strong um, symbiotic relationship with about 95% of all terrestrial plants. Um, but, you know, as I talked about before, they're in the nature's internet and they, they play a vital role. Um, not only do they, do they provide the plant with nutrients, um, they they protect the plant from heavy metals, either um, binding it in, in the mycelial structure or taking it up into the plant, um, help the plant with, with water acquisition, um, defense against pathogens and diseases and, and things like that. Um, so, so definitely apply it. I would buy some mycorrhizae fungi. Um, and, you know, uh, I won't go through these, these steps, but uh, if, if you buy it online, um, they will give uh, instructions of, of how to do it. So this is an example. Um, this is Nance Clem. She's, she's a really uh, great human based in Chicago. Um, and she teaches people about bioremediation and, and um, urban planting. Um, so we're, we're planting a tree with mycorrhizae fungi. Um, but, but not all plants form a mycorrhizae connection. So, so uh, different plants that don't are brassicas um, and a lot of different names that I I won't, won't try pronouncing, um, but you can take a screenshot or, or watch the replay of, of these different plants. Um, so rules of thumb, when, when 
inoculating with mycorrhizae fungi. Um, avoid the use of heavy fertilizers that contain phosphorus and um, or just pesticides, herbicides, fungicides in general. Be gentle with it, um, and soil temperatures between 65 or temperatures between 65 and 75 are the best for for starting your mycorrhizae um, inoculums. So these are some different sources for mycorrhizae fungi. Um, I'm sure a lot of these companies do bulk applications if you want to do uh, a, a wide uh, application for, for your farm. This is a really good book, Teaming with Fungi. If you want to learn more about cultivating your own mycorrhizae fungi, um, the benefits of it, and, and the ins and outs of mycorrhizae fungi. Um, this is a mycelial barrier. So with, with water filtration, um, this is something that we will create in the in the grant we're working on in Vermont is uh, creating a mycelial barrier uh, to filter runoff water. Um, and this is, we're focusing on E. coli, but this could be for heavy metals, this could be um, for chemicals as well to prevent um, it from either entering your farm or um, from your farm contaminants running off into uh, the, the stream. So this is a picture of King Strafaria. Um, this is the mushroom that we're using to filter E. coli. Um, so if you know any farms, uh, this is the mushroom to use um, if you want to filter E. coli. Um, some more pictures on, on some, some filters to use. Um, one, of, one of the research projects that I did um, last year was on the microremediation of cigarette butts. Uh, they're one of the most littered objects in the world. Uh, they're made of uh, cellulose acetate, which is a form of plastic. Um, and I did some research on using fungi, some bacteria, some enzymes um, to remediate the toxins leached out of cigarette butts that you see everywhere. Um, even a lot of farms, you know, some of the farm workers will be smoking cigarette butts, or if you live in an urban uh, environment, people flick them everywhere. Um, and they're really, really toxic. Um, this is a picture of the mushrooms actually fruiting off of the cigarette butts and breaking down the plastic, hopefully. Um, and there's a picture of uh, a big mushroom fruiting off of a cake of cigarette butts um, for me to get the new genetics of, of this mushroom um, to uh, have, have this new species of oyster mushroom that can be more adapted to, to toxins. Um, and this is really important to, um, for you know, mycologists like me um, or if you really get into this, um, is to, to get DNA, to get new spores. And, and this is really important for plants. Um, people who are really into it are, are really into the genetics. Um, so if you're um, really into cleaning up uh, toxic waste or um, um, you, you want to clone different mushrooms um, from a toxic environment um, and, and have them evolve. Uh, and they evolve very, very quickly so you can get a species um, that is acclimated to your farm in particular and your toxins on your, on your land or in your, in your waterways. Um, so enzymes, mushrooms produce enzymes to break down chemicals. Um, and I think they're the future on a, on a, on a mass scale. So, so this is going beyond um, just remediating a, a, a little plot in an urban setting. Um, this is on an industrial scale. Um, you can collect uh, enzymes um, from commercial mushroom farms or these big bioreactors in the last picture. Um, and they're, they're basically what decompose the, the chemicals in our soils. And I, and I envision it on a, on a mass scale, on, on brownfield sites, on super fun sites. Um, we have so much land in the U.S. that is you know, it's toxic. We can't grow food on it, but with the right tools and applications, we can make more land to plant more trees, to plant more food, to plant more medicine, more food forests, and, and more soil for, for seven generations ahead. Um, so I envision us cultivating these enzymes on a mass scale and spraying them either from uh, a truck or an airplane, um, dropping it on, on very toxic, big, big plots of land. Um, this is a technique uh, of basically turning the soil as uh, someone is spraying. So this is if, you're, if we're dealing with 
a lot of soil that's really, really contaminated, uh, when can, can make them into these piles, um, turn them over while we're spraying them with compost tea and these fungal enzymes. And the compost tea, the bacteria, and the enzymes will work symbiotically um, to remediate the toxins in the soil. Um, we can go over with plants on the piles um, to pull up heavy metals, um, bring the plants to uh, a incinerator and, and harvest the heavy metals if they're, if they're precious metals. Um, if the toxins are really deep into our soils, um, there's this technique called bioventing. So we can have these tubes going very deep into the soil and pump air, we can pump oxygen, uh, we can pump nutrients, we can pump enzymes, bacterial tea, to get really deep down into the soil um, and, and clean on a, a really deep level. Um, and, if, and if we're really advanced, we can use a fungal bioreactor. Um, I doubt an, anyone in here will, will use this, um, but uh, this is commercial remediation of, say, uh, dye water. Um, if you're upstream from a factory that is making dyes or using dyes, um, this, this is a, a, a method of, of cleaning water before it's discharged into the river. Um, so it's disc of mycelium spinning around and, and cleaning the water. Um, and for, for big oil spills as well, um, I see a feature. Uh, um, instead of burning the oil on the surface, we can drop these enzymes and bacterial teas on the surface um, and clean them up. So, you know, we have more biodiversity of life. We have more fish in the sea. We can have fish farms um, and we can have clean waterways and, and clean air um, and clean soil. So we can plant more food, have more farmers, uh, more sustainability, more biodiversity in life. Um, and, and those plastic islands the size of Texas in our oceans, um, we are finding more and more fungi day after day that can decompose plastics. Um, they evolve very, very quickly. And I think we can use the same mechanism of, of spraying um, on landfills and on, on these floating islands of trash and decompose our plastic and create more soil and, and, and faster cycles of evolution um, so we can have more sustainability, more food, more medicine. Um, so moving forward, we need to connect. We need to learn. Um, we need to enter more webinars and podcasts and, and educational events like this, read more books, um, learn from each other, teach each other. Um, if you have a skill, teach it um, and, and open source uh, this information and prepare. Um, you know, this, this world, we're, we're not using it sustainably, a lot of humans. So we, we need to prepare. We need to plant more food. Uh, we need to make more soil. Um, we need to work together and, and take some action um, and infect the others. So um, this is a, this is a, mes a message from, from Mother Earth. Um, she left it for us, so we need to clean up our, our mess. Uh, if you want to learn more about mushrooms and, and the magic of mushrooms, um, I'm teaching a three-day uh, workshop event um, at Cosm Ch Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, June 8th through 10th. It's a three-day event. It's going to be a blast. Um, it's going to be with me and Martin Bridge. He's an incredible artist in Western Massachusetts. Um, and if you really, you really want to learn more about this, um, there's a five-day masterclass in, in Wingdale, upstate New York, um, August 6th through 9th. Um, and it's a masterclass to learn everything you can from, from the, the uh, masters in the field um, on micro-remediation. And we have a weekend portion after that that's open for the public. It's sliding scale. And it's a big mushroom festival. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Lots of great food. Lots of great uh, educators. So if you, if, you know, from this, this webinar, if mushrooms really fascinated you, come out um, and check out my shop. Um, check out my book. I have it in ebook and physical form if you want to learn more about um, cleaning up uh, toxic waste and, and integrating this into your farm um, and into your community, um, or you want some medicine for yourself. Um, I have a lot of tinctures and, and dried mushrooms, et cetera. And 10% of the profits go to planting fruit and nut trees in Western Massachusetts to feed homeless and local communities. Um, and I want to thank everyone again uh, for tuning in. And we'll open uh, it now for questions. So. 
um, please mm-hmm. type it in in the chat box or um, Anna will, will read your questions off. All right. Alex, my gosh, this, this was a tremendous presentation. And I, I tell you, um, I hope the, the viewing audience and the listening audience learned as much as I did. I have gotten um, a wealth of information of what the power of what mushrooms can do in terms of healing our soil and really healing the planet in general. Um, just as a reminder, we definitely want your questions. Uh, this is such a powerful topic that Alex has presented tonight. Uh, you can put into that chat feature at the top right-hand corner of your screen, or you can text me directly at 413-214-1237. And Alex, just to get the ball started, we do have a few questions that came in. Um, so we'll just get right to it. A lot of great information that you shared with us tonight. You mentioned early in your presentation that uh, mushrooms can uh, assist bees to boost their immune system. Can you go into a little tad more detail on that? Yes. Uh, so one species in particular is red-belted conch. Um, this grows all around the world, um, and it's, a, it's an incredible mushroom. And, and mushrooms, they excrete enzymes. And a lot of times you'll see, if you go out into the woods and you see these mushrooms, uh, fruiting off of trees, you'll see these little droplets um, on the edges of the mushroom. And, and this happens when, when rain washes the, the metabolites of the mushroom um, and forms these droplets on the mushroom itself. And sometimes you'll see bees um, attracted to these droplets and they'll, they'll fly and, and try to um, sip up the enzymes. Um, mycelium is very sweet a lot of times and it has a very uh, pungent, earthy smell and a lot of bees are attracted to it. Um, and some bees around the world will actually take a piece of mycelium and feed it to, to the larva um, and, and to give those medicinal compounds to the young beads, uh, bees um, when they're in their larva stage. Um, if for more information, you can look up Paul Stamets. Um, he has a, a, a couple great talks about this. Um, he had, has a podcast with Joe Rogan um, highly recommend listening to it. He goes into more detail as well. Okay. Great, great. Thank you so much for that. And um, just as a quick sidebar note, there was a question from a viewer if uh, this will be, if the recording would be online, and yes, it will be uh, available via our YouTube channel, and the link will also be on our website if you'd like to go back and do this again. And if you let me know, uh, send me your email information. I definitely will get the, uh, the link directly to you. Um, another question concerning um, boosting the immune system. Uh, and you mentioned in relation to what it can do for the human immune system, is it safe to say that uh, mushrooms um, can boost the overall soil health? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so just that clarification on... Um, on some health, uh, they not only boost it, but they actually modulate the, the immune system. So if our immune system is, is too high, um, and this happens in, in a lot of times in cities and urban settings, um, we're, we're surrounded by so many toxins and so many noises that our immune system is overacting. Um, we're seeing a lot more uh, a rise of allergies, um, which is basically our immune system freaking out. Um, it's on overdrive. Um, and, and mushrooms have an incredible b- ability to, to modulate our immune system. So bring it back down, or if it's too low, it brings it back up and, and creates homeostasis, um, uh, which is, is really incredible. Um, could you, re- you repeat the question one more time? Sure, sure, definitely. Uh, how does this boost, or how can mushrooms boost the overall immune system of the soil itself? So how does it increase soil health? Right. So the the more biodiversity we have in our soil, uh, the healthier our soil is. Um, And this is for pathogens. um, And it's a reason why we're seeing so many um, different different plant pathogens when we're doing monoculture um, and and we're farming in in a huge uh, industrial agricultural way. Um, It's because we're lacking the biodiversity in our soils. um, And and this causes our, our, our food to be less nutritious um, and our plants to be to be really uh, weaker, um, and they have a our our plants have, have less of an, an immune system because they're not forming the mycorrhizae associations um, 
the, the bacteria, the fungi in the soils aren't breaking down the chemicals. Um, and so they're, they're weakening the plants um, and uh, they're, they're not, you know, mining, you know, fungi can mine phosphorus. And, and if we don't have fungi in our soils, we can't mine the phosphorus and we're, we're left to mine it ourselves and, and give, you know, chemically mined phosphorus to our plants, um, et cetera. Um, and also for the micro, uh, different, you know, things like worms and nematodes and, and, and some of the, the bigger uh, insects and, and animals, um, you know, if, if we don't have great soil, um, they perish as well and, and eventually leads to us um, and our demise. Um, if we don't have soil, we're, we're going down. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Tyler, and this is a great three-part question. Uh, is there evidence that fungi completely break down chemicals like glyphosate and neocannoids? Should we be growing only on organic certified substrates when growing for eating? So very, very two in-depth questions there for you. Um, thanks, Tyler. I, I haven't done any research with glyphosate. Uh, Glyphosate, uh, or you know, I'm, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, but um, I haven't read any studies about that. Um, you know, a, a lot of this happens in the forest as well. When it, when a tree um, falls down, um, there's there's a lot of different enzymes that fungi um, can can uh, excrete to break down certain um, uh, things in in the tree or the chemical itself. Um, so cellulose, hemicellulose, and, and lignin, um, and secondary tertiary decomposers, um, which can come in and, and decompose it. So um, there's some evidence that some, um, some mushrooms and some fungi can completely decompose um, some chemicals, like I did research with the cigarette butts, and um, oyster mushrooms were able to completely break down um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, I haven't heard about the chemicals that you uh, listed. Um, I think we should be always growing on organic certified substrates. Um, in terms of mushroom growing, uh, I, I don't feel like I'm worried about growing on non-organic uh, substrates. I do. Um, all, all my growing, of course, that is on certified organic substrates. Um, uh, mushrooms don't hyperaccumulate it into their fruiting bodies. Uh, unless that substrate has heavy metals in it, um, which, you know, a lot of certified organic substrates have um, little or, or no heavy metals that are, are toxic for, for humans. Um, so so I, I would grow um, on all certified organic substrates. Okay, very good. Thank you for that question, Tyler. It was much, much appreciated. Um, Will had a question concerning, um, he'd like to follow, I'd like to know how we can follow the progress on, on the grant that you have in Vermont. Yeah, um, we will, you know, you can follow me on Facebook, Alex Dorr, D-O-R-R, -R. Um, follow me on Instagram, Mushroom Revival, and I'll, I'll be sure to be posting information about it. Um, and you can check out my website as well, mushroomrevival.com. Um, if you go to the event in Wingdale, New York, we're going to have a series of presentations uh, describing the data, describing the whole experiment, and um, more initiative for you to come. And, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be posting it everywhere, but definitely follow me on social media, and um, I'll, I'll be posting the information as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, a great question from Raymond in terms of a practical application. He mentions there is a beautiful lake in Guatemala that is badly polluted from human waste and chemical fertilizers. Can mushrooms be used to clean this large lake? Size is five miles long by about one mile wide. Yes, um, it can. And, and, and you know, uh, the, the first step of action is, is to go to the source. So um, human waste and chemical fertilizers, we need to go to the farms and, and the people um, you know, the, that are polluting this lake. Uh, um, there's, there's this organization in Guatemala um, called Fungi Academy. Um, you might be familiar with it, but uh, they are in Lake Atiklan, um, and they, which, I, you know, it might be the lake that you're talking about. Um, and they're working with fungi and 
um, local communities. Um, they have been wanting me to go down there and, and teach about micromediation. Um, and so, yeah, I would love to link up with you and, and see what link you're talking about. Um, there's this technique uh, that indigenous people in, in Mexico have used. I'm sorry that uh, I've, I'm forgetting the name of the, and the indigenous people, so I, I apologize. Um, but they're floating rafts of, of um, basically how to grow food. Um, and, and float these rafts in, in the center of a lake and uh, they'll, they'll cultivate um, their food um, with the roots floating down in, in the raft. And, and it's kind of, uh, it's aquaponics in a, in a way that the fish are, are pooping in, in, um, in the lake and, and giving fertilizer to the plants and the plants roots are fixing the nitrogen. So we can use a similar setup of a floating raft um, with mycelium um, and, and just kind of float it around the lake. Um, we can use these floating rafts we can even use plastic bottles to help float, you know, recycle plastic bottles to help the island float. Um, we plant in between it to have the roots help uh, clean um, and then have mycelium in there as well. Um, but the first step in, in cleaning that lake, I think, would, would go to the source and to stop it directly. Okay, very good. Uh, we've got time for one more question, it looks like. Um, I'd like to, um, there was a question that came in via text concerning inoculation that, and you were talking about that a little bit. Uh, can mushrooms be used to inoculate seeds before planting? Yes, uh, this is, this is, um, this is uh, mycorrhizae fungi. So um, you can, okay. you can order it here. I'll go back to the slide um, there on a text. So it might not be able to, I'll, I'll just um, tell you. So dif different sources for mycorrhizae fungi are fungi perfecti, mycorrhizae applications, plant health care, reforestation technologies, um, Centium Organics, Valent Biosciences Corporation, and Bioterra. Um, these are all places that you can get mycorrhizae fungi inoculum. Um, they can even be weaved in, in uh, clay seed balls, um, but you know, what you really want to do when, when applying mycorrhizae fungi is getting it as early as possible. So seedlings are okay, cuttings are okay, but if you can get it at the seed stage, that, that's the best to inoculate. So, so yes, okay. you can in, inoculate seeds with, with fungi. Okay, very good. And this last question that came in via text is concerning um, the barriers that you showed in those last few slides. Um, have you ever done this with any urban growing situations here, community garden, urban farms? Um, and if so, how, what were the results? How did you apply it? Was there a spacing issue? Uh, barriers. Uh, no, it, it's, um, so right now, because of lack of funding, um, you know, this, this is the, uh, this is the initiative that we're, we're trying to do in Vermont, or we are doing in Vermont. Um, we got $10,000 um, and we're already applying for more grants to, to take it to a, a bigger level. And um, I'm talking to a lot of different people um, to take micromediation on a, a very uh, larger scale. Um, I, have, I have done remediation in urban settings, and, um, but there wasn't enough funding to really um, get the soil tested and and, uh, and have thousands of dollars to, to create a, uh, a a big portfolio of a, a scientific paper. Um, so it's very grassroots, um, and the the results were were very um, you know you could see it from your eye, but there's no uh, scientific testing to uh, to re to reveal the the facts um, uh, on on that scale. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good, very good. Well, thank you again, Alex. And I, I want to make sure as we are starting to wrap up that we get your contact information. I know there are folks that want to reach out to you directly, both for the two um, conferences that are coming up that you will be, uh, um, be presenting at, as well as some of the information that you discussed. What is the best way for folks to contact you? Um, I'm going to put it in the chat box right now, um, but for people listening on the phone, um, it's mushroomrevival at gmail.com.
Um, you can feel free to add me on Facebook, uh, Alex Dorr, D-O-R-R. Um, follow me on Instagram, at Mushroom Revival, um, or go on to my website. There's, there's various ways you can just Google Alex Dorr into Google, Alex Dorr Mushrooms, and, and it'll pop up everywhere. Um, everything is connected in the, in, a, in the internet world, but um, mushroomrevival at gmail.com is, is a great email to to email me at. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Alex, for your time tonight. And thank you to everyone who called in, who actually logged in and, and saw the webinar. Uh, I would love your responses. If you have additional questions, please feel free. You can also send them to me at Anna at nofamass.org. If you have feedback about this particular webinar or any webinars, I definitely would love to hear from you. Uh, don't forget the NOFA Summer Conference is coming. We're going back home at Hampshire College, August 10th, 11th, and 12th. Registration is up and online and available. Please take advantage of that early bird registration. Uh, if you're with a group, please let me know, and we can work out some very, very nice discounts for groups of five or more. Uh, you can email me again, or you can uh, call me directly at 413-214-1237. Uh, this video or this recording will be made available no later than Monday. And if you'd like your own personal link, please uh, just send me a request. You can email it to me and I'll send you a link directly. Again, thank you, Alex, for your time. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and phoning in. Please uh, stay tuned. Look forward to next month in June. We will have Julie Fine back talking about cover crops. Yes, we'll be moving into that period where cover crops is something we'd want to work with. And uh, we'll be getting that information out online very soon. If you want your personal invitation, email me and we'll send you your personal invitation for that uh, webinar with Julie Fine. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Enjoy the uh, first part of summer and look forward to seeing you next month. Much love, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank <laughs> you.